relations. Uh, and I'm gonna read this because it was very special to us. So the city requested the legislatures to allocate $250,000 for the transportation assessment to consider a multimodal connectivity along the I-5 corridor between DuPont and Lakewood. And uh, the intention is to improve the connectivity of the South Sound area through multimodal transportation network. Uh, equitable access to transportation is the top priority to this project, for this project. We are asking the state legislatures to allocate study funding to plan for the future of regional transit. So on March 31st, the House released sending spending budget was included the study, the study funding. We are very pleased with the, to hear that. The plan is to be able to go from DuPont to Lakewood without getting onto I-5. So that's been in the a plan for a while, but now we have the study funds to go for it. Thank you. So more to follow on that. We're very happy to have that. And as you are aware, there's a lot of construction projects going on that will continue throughout the year. At least that is the plan. Um, the city staff has been very successful in obtaining grants to support us in the upkeep and improvement of our parks. Um, based on the recommendations, access to American Lake Park waterfront will be upgraded. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Okay, thank you. The, the park, the waterfront will be upgraded and it's due for a new parking lot because as you know, in that area, there's been a, always been a problem with parking and getting the boats in and out because of the overcrowded parking lot. So the city was able to purchase some land across the street and put in a, a parking lot. So that would be additional parking there. Fort Stillicum Park would get an artificial turf infill. Wards Lake Park will be getting uh, general enhancements. Um, some ongoing projects, rebuild the traffic signal at 100, and 100 Street Southwest and Lakewood Drive. You may have noticed some in construction going on there. They're uh, upgrading that uh, traffic signal in that area and they will be putting in sidewalks on 100 Street Southwest. So that's gonna make it very walkable for a lot of people in and out of the city. So lots of work going on to improve the city for all of us. So that's a good thing. Some summer events, uh, the Lakewood Farmers Market begins May 21st at Fort Stillicum Park. It'll be every Friday from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. until September 24th. Over 55 unique vendors are expected to be to participate. This year, it's been, you know, that area was so popular last year that the, the request was that we have it there again this year. So that's why it's going to be at Fort Stillicum Park. Summer night concert series includes six uh, shows scheduled for July and August. A variety of music is planned, but no, nothing in concrete at this point. We don't have any particular names at this point. Uh, the drive-in movie screening is scheduled for six Friday evenings in June and July. That event will follow the farmer's market and they will have food trucks there. Planning is on the way for the celebration for the 25th anniversary for the city of Lakewood. That is scheduled for September 18th. So we have, a, we have that to look forward to. Uh, nothing final yet, but lots of exciting things are going into the making of that. So that's gonna be another event to look forward to. Unfortunately, our popular summer fest will not be this year. Sad to say that. So that's all I have for tonight. I will stop here for some questions if I can answer any for you, if you have them. Certainly we'll uh, ask if any of the board directors have a question just to raise their hand. Mary, you, uh, I'll, then I'll go ahead and acknowledge them because I don't know if you can see all the people on the screen. But I would say uh, from my own response, I'm so grateful for the uh, study, the impact the study on the opportunity to uh, not open up just DuPont, but Tilcom is such a vital part of our community. And so I'm assuming that Tilcom is in that as well. I mean, that would be my understanding. Can you clarify if Tilcom 
is yes. being considered. Right, it is part of the, the plan. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or insight from the board directors for Mary Moss? Well, Mary, we're grateful. Thank you for sharing and please uh, communicate our appreciation to the uh, city council as well. Thank you so much and you guys have a good meeting. You too. Thank you. We will now move to the reports uh, from the superintendent. There were no public comments uh, sent for tonight's meeting. So we're moving to uh, Superintendent Ron Banner and if you would share uh, your reports at this time. Thank you, President Dr. Schaefer. I will uh, reiterate the years of service ceremony and give thanks to Director of Marketing Communications, Leanna Albrecht for her arrangement of the ceremony. Um, it was pleasing to see all of our 30 and 35 year service folks and just mention to the public that, um, or to the board, that we um, will also have celebrations, uh, recognitions for those employees that reach the 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 year marks. Those will happen in the schools or in different department meetings. Um, and we like to do the big presentation for our 30 and 35. So that re went really well from my perspective. Regarding student achievement, several students that I'd like to highlight, Clover Park High School's David Decat, excuse me, David Castro accepted uh, to Cornell University and is also going through the process of acceptance to Harvard. Uh, David will have some tough decisions to make. Um, Clover Park High School student Kayla Purdy um, who was also on my youth advisory team, was accepted to the University of North Carolina's uh, Honor College. Lake student Brian Moore has an appointment to the Air Force Academy. Lake student Sarah Bame is a National Merit Scholarship finalist. Harrison Prep student Lillian Avalos has been accepted to George Military, excuse me, Georgia Military College and Georgia Southern University. Her goal is to get into West Point. Um, Harrison Prep students Isabella Beltran and Elil Ortiz have successfully completed phase one curriculum of the Western Aerospace Scholars Program, and both have qualified to participate in phase two, which is a summer experience. Regarding community engagement, this year's Daffodil Parade was a stationary event for the safety of community members and parade participants. The floats uh, will be displayed on April 7th through 11th, or worse, displayed, and will also uh, be displayed on April 14th through the 18th at the Washington State Fairgrounds. Um, I did send you all pictures last Friday of Clover Park's float, and I want to give a special thanks to Therese High for her work in designing and coordinating the float activities. As you all know, a float uh, is a requirement uh, in order to have daffodil princesses. And this year, Clover Park High School was represented by Princess Kayala Purdy, and Lakes High School was represented by Princess Laura Schultes. We are coordinating a possible tour of Harrison Prep for this Thursday with Pierce County Executive Bruce Dammeyer. Um, Executive Dan Meyer's office requested this tour with me for the afternoon of April 15th. We did confirm that today. As part of the tour, um, Executive Dan Meyer has requested the opportunity to meet briefly with some students. Of course, we will practice all social distancing, masking, and safety requirements um, to ensure that everybody stays safe. Lakewood Rotary Educator and Student of the Month program has been relaunched an educator and student will be recognized each month from April through June. Several Clover Park student uh, seniors will receive educational incentive awards from the Lakewood Rotary. Um, students can receive up to $1,500 to support their higher education or post-secondary ambitions. Uh, winners will be announced at the May 21st Lakewood Rotary meeting. April is the month of the military child. The district has partnered with JBLM to share resources and um, virtual opportunities for our families. 
The district has created an informal, excuse me, informational web page on the uh, month of the military child that is posted to our district site, also accessible from our school websites. And additional information to support military families has also been posted on the district website under the parent tab. With regard to return to learning, schools will survey families to gather information on which educational opportunities or models they would prefer their students be in, in the fall of 2021. Elementary schools will reach out directly to families to collect data and secondary schools will collect data via a form on the Skyward Family Access app. This information will be used to support our fall 2021 planning. And this evening, we also have Deputy Superintendent Brian Laba, who will present the district's preliminary draft COVID recovery plan. Once the district has received additional guidance from OSPI, we will be submitting a final draft proposal for board approval and submission to OSPI for June 1st. Um, so we will be in contact as we get more information. And with that, I will turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Laba for the presentation. All right. All right, thank you, board president, board members, and superintendent for the opportunity to present, present our ideas and thinking about academic recovery um, and recovery plan as we move forward. The state legislature, the state legislature and House Bill 1638 and OSBI have set a deadline of June 1, as you heard before, from the districts for school districts across the state to have their plans approved by their school boards. Um, additionally, we're also providing some um, background to a new policy we'd like the board to consider adopting regarding social emotional climate. We'll be taking any questions at the end of the presentation. But we do know so far, as the legislature and OSBI have set a deadline of June 1, what we don't have is the template or document that we need to submit um, to OSBI that has not been released at the time of developing this presentation or as of today. We do know the board must approve by resolution our academic recovery plan prior to submission, and this is required to access our SR2 and SR3 dollars allocated by federal government and reimbursed through the state. We do know through presentations from OSPI and federal legislation behind the SR allocations, um, some context for a recovery plan. Um, you can see those elements in this slide um, and that any recovery plan should probably incorporate any one or all of those um, components. House Bill 1638 requires OSPI to develop the survey or template that districts must use. Specific plan requirements in 1638 include, but are not limited to, identification of specific diagnostic assessment tools by grade level, identification of student learning and well being gaps, and others. We have been, and now in some in person, administering the STAR and MAP assessments. We will have Center for Educational Effectiveness student survey data by the end of the school year to help with um, understanding student academic growth and students' perceptions around their social, emotional, and mental health. <clears throat> this quote is from Getting Clearer, Schooling Loss is Not Learning Loss by Kelly Nichols and Becca Middles. I just kind of want to read this quote. Um, because I think it's pretty powerful in terms of where we've been in the past year. We'll never be back to what was, we are all changed. We must let go of standardization and turn towards personalization and actualiz actualization. Our ability to do this well will be a turning point as the entire world shifts into a new way of being post pandemic. Successful academic recovery is making sure students have been exposed to and practice the grade level standards. By guaranteeing this, we develop lifelong learners who are able to become leaders, collaborate with one another, and develop character. Loss is less about recovering that term paper, that novel, that standardized exam, and more about ensuring essential skills such as thinking critically about text, solving problems with evidence are taught, understood, and measured. We see the components of a recovery plan being a blend of these three um, topics, academic, social, emotional learning, and activities. 
by doing so, we have started this spring with this notion and we are planning for the summer and the next two school years to blend these three components together. It is important to support and promote school and school district action plans that create and maintain physically, emotionally, and intellectually safe, respectful, and positive school and classroom environments that foster equitable and ethical social, emotional, and academic education for all students. Each and every school community member should be treated with dignity, should have the opportunity to learn, work, interact, and socialize in a physically, emotionally, and intellectually safe, respectful, and positive school and classroom environment and have the opportunity to experience high quality relationships. These are statements found in um, the suggested policy 3112. Our plan includes uh, project-based learning or PBL. We see PBL connecting well with the district's four pillars. As a lifelong learner, you learn to manage your educational plan, you value education, and as a result, you're more engaged. As a collaborator, you facilitate problem solving and value the input of others. As you develop character, you just de demonstrate your best self, work perseverance, grit, and become more self-aware. As you develop leadership skills, you're willing to serve and support others, and PBL empowers others to lead. The next couple slides are about um, our recovery planning to date. Some of these plans have already begun, and we're using other district funds to support this work, such as our learning assistance um, plan or LAP dollars. The focus in elementary is four part. Um, we believe in early literacy skills for our earliest learners, kinder through second grade, language labs for our multilingual students, for our intermediate students, grades three through five, we're focusing on PBL units that are either academic or social emotionally connected or both, and ensuring students are ready for math at the next grade level. We began PBL today at multiple sites across the district. We approved teacher developed PBL plans and also provided PBL lesson and units we had with teachers who are willing to work with students after school between now and the end of May. We'll continue PBL in the summer for two week sessions. We plan on offering three sessions during the summer. Through this work, we'll also support students' social, emotional, and mental health, as well as improve upon their academic interests. We have also been coordinating our work with the special education department so that any of their academic recovery needs or extended year services are happening at the same time and at the same sites. For intermediate students, grades six through eight, we are also focusing on project-based learning units as well. We began PBL today as well at multiple sites across the district and will continue PBL in the summer during the two week sessions for three sessions. In addition to support our secondary students who are learning virtually and for our students who are coming in person who need more one on one support we're asking you later in this meeting to approve a resolution to contract with paper. Paper is a 24 hour seven days a week academic support resource for secondary students grades six through 12 that provides tutorial services. All the tutors hired for, to work for paper are trained in the Socratic teaching method. That is, students must try to come up with the answer with the tutor asking supportive questions along the way prior to the tutor providing the student with an answer. <clears throat> we began our efforts in high school on March 23rd, a plan to supplement academic credit retrieval programming already taking place in our high schools to ensure our students have ample time and resources to complete required credit retrieval before graduation and the end of the school year. Initially, we focused on supporting our 12th graders and are moving on to support our 11th graders. We're currently running credit support lab two days a week after school and then on Saturdays in order to provide additional time and direct connection with staff. We will run our typical credit retrieval program for other grade levels and are looking to expand beyond academics to include student interest areas around technical education, arts, and athletics in order to support so student social, emotional, and mental health. Paper will also be made available for the remainder of the school, school year for our high school students through the summer and into the next two school years. We will blend, blend funding where we can on programming. We'll use LAP, SPED, and Title I funds where necessary and supplement our program with SR2 funds. We'll be able to access our SR2 funds after our plan is approved by the board in May and submitted to OSPI by June 1. In the meantime, we will be using our existing LAP and title funds to support academic recovery K-12. 
As we learn more about the S use of SR3 funds, we'll use them in our fall 2020 and beyond planning. So that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions? I have Susie Contos here too. Um, all right, I got to stop share. There we go. To help with any questions that you might have. Well, Brian, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you. And then uh, I've already noticed that Alyssa had her hand up and so did Carol. So Alyssa, why don't you start and then we'll go to Carol. Okay. Um, thanks for the presentation. I did, I had just mentioned when I did the report at the city council meeting that this is something we would be doing and we were working on it. Um, and Deputy Mayor um, Whalen had asked if there was a way that we would be able to tell like at the start of the school year or maybe even now of what students are um, more behind maybe than others because of course when you're working at home you know there's different very variables for maybe who fell further behind than others and will there be a way to kind of like gauge the students obviously will be probably apparent to some teachers. I didn't know if, he didn't know if there might be a formal process for that. Well, we, as I mentioned, we have continued to do the STAR assessment, which is our assessment we do um, for reading and math for our kinder and first graders. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing math for um, students second grade through ninth grade, um, also in reading and math. Um, so we do have some data around how students are progressing. So um, okay. we have seen student growth um, from our fall to winter testing. Uh, whether we are able to do the spring testing is really dependent on whether the state gets their assessment waiver from the U.S. Department of Ed. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we, we are probably going to suspend um, STAR and MAP in the spring if we have to administer the uh, Smarter Balance assessments. But we do have some growth data. We have seen growth from the fall to spring for students. Um, during uh, student conferencing mid-March, uh, teachers were sharing that growth data with families during the student conferencing, parent-teacher conferencing as well. So. Um, we, we do have a little bit of information. Um, you know, it'd be nice to round it out with the spring, right? So you get sort of a full year, mm -hmm. but um, so we'll see how that goes, what happens with the state and their uh, request to waive the assessment. But um, we have been monitoring student growth as we have always. Um, it's yeah. a little bit different, it's a little bit, right. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit different to give a test remotely, right? That's how we did it in the fall, right? So everybody was doing their testing from home. As we moved back to on-site learning, um, a lot of the STAR assessment was able to be done in person and some of the MAP as well. So, um, uh, you know, changing the testing environment as well. But mm -hmm. you know, parents are very supportive of um, doing the assessment from home. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Carol, I noticed you had your hand up as well. Um, want to comment and a question. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to share the learning loss versus schooling loss. I've read that several times um, since I received our packet. And, and I hope that we get the opportunity, maybe this might be a, I hope we get the opportunity to share this with, it, it just helps create an understanding about our different times. And it's a very powerful statement. And I think it's succinct and it's, it, it says exactly what needs to be said. And even though I've read it several times, I need to go back to it to remind myself of just this message. Um, on the high school summer school, will this be a credit retrieval program? Will this be an enhancement program? Um, is it is it different than summer school in the past? It'll be a little bit of all of what you just said. Uh, it'll be <laughs> our traditional credit retrieval, right? But um, one thing that uh, Kevin Akita has been making sure we're paying attention to is the social, emotional, and mental health needs of the students. So how do we incorporate any athletic um, activities, uh, um, clubs, um, things that engage students in a different way than just coming to school to re um, retrieve credit? So we're, if you saw my whiteboard now, you see a bunch of scribbling about planning what all the different levels look like. Um, we, are, we have also been talking to the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club about how they can support us um, in the afternoons after we do our morning sessions at the elementary and the middle schools. So um, we're going to 
probably formalize that by the end of the week, um, what that planning looks like for the Y. Um, we are also using the YMCA. Um, they have a program called Power School, and we're gonna, they're going to help us with the academic part at the elementary. So trying to utilize some of our partners, right, that are good at that kind of work. Um, and uh, we don't necessarily oh. have to use our staff all the time, right? Kind of give everyone a little bit of a break, right? Well, and we know that students listen to adults. They don't necessarily they listen to adults um so the summer school will be for high school but you opened up the can of worms to me on the mill on mill on elementary and middle school will there be programs for them other than lap students yes all okay. students will have access to summer programming okay when will that i don't know if i've missed something is that have you we haven't really missed anything okay it, uh, Susie has a big plan that she's going to present tomorrow in instructional council. Okay, okay, I'll which, let you have. I'll let you. started I, I from a, a, a big drawing on my board, whiteboard in my office, so which got expanded today when Kevin came in. So, okay, um, we're we're very close to um, being able to share what our plans are, but it, it's really uh, elementary and middle. It will be two week sessions and there'll be three two week sessions. So you, you can participate in one session, two sessions, or all okay. three sessions. So however well, you do it. That smacks, that really smacks of learning loss and school loss and having to do things different. And I really appreciate from your whiteboard charts to to where you are today because it's it's what our kids need. And giving families more options is is powerful. Thank you very much for that. Carol, let me just add that the options that we will be providing to families will be, we will be removing, not reducing, but removing all barriers to participation. Okay. We, will not, we will not charge a dime. Uh, we will be contracting with our community-based partners to support their programming for our kids. And again, this will not be impactful to our normal budget because we will be accessing the federal stimulus dollars to do this to support our kids. Okay, one other question on that vein then, will this, will it all be in person? Will it be virtual, hybrid, both? I mean, and if you you have all the right in the world to say, we're not there yet, Carol, <laughs> give us a chance. No, we're planning I'm excited both. and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. We're planning both in person and virtual, right? Kind okay. of need the, you know, um, if you look at the statistics in middle or in middle and high school, we have a number of families who kept their uh, students home and learned to learn virtually. So we know that that's an option that a lot of families want, but we also know that there are some uh, families who want in person. So we're gonna do both. We've really called our learning sites hubs, right? Hubs for okay. academic recovery. So that's what okay. we're um, shooting for. Um, Cause really we want to blend uh, so special ed has a need too to bring in students for uh, academic recovery as well as uh, mm -hmm. extended year services. So we're trying to do all this stuff at our hub sites, right? Um, well, my granddaughter announced to me that I think there's nine weeks of school left. And of course I did not tell her, I don't think you've been in school enough. <laughs> so um, this, <laughs> poor Allison, this would be the good news or bad news. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank Ron, thank you for, directing your staff into making sure that it's accessible to all kids and, and that our partners are in place. And Brian, I know I can imagine what your whiteboard looks like. So thank you so much. One more, one more quick piece to add is that um, I just, I want to make sure that when we talk about this, I'm setting the stage and that we're setting the stage. And Brian talked about this over the course of the next several years. This is not a summer recovery. Right. This, is a, this, this will be over the course of several years. And as we talk to our community partners, if you if you know Charlie Davis from the YMCA, I mean, he and I in a room, it's like motivation to the 10th degree, right, or the 10th power. And so um, we are really talking about supporting our kids, supporting our community, um, because for us to, to work with the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club or any of our mental health uh, uh, service providers, infusing the support for our kids is also infusing an economic recovery for those community-based organizations as well. Um, and so, um, but we're really, we're really, um, we're, we're very specific about the amount of time that we have and the amount of resource that we have 
so that we're not over promising things that we cannot continue because um, we do have to see this as one time dollars right um, and that's what they are now that doesn't mean that if we find something that's productive and fruitful for us that we don't as a district consider should we be looking at that and and putting resources towards the whatever that is um, but but this recovery process and i will probably say this over and over again until you guys start saying yeah ron we get it we know um, but it is a multi-year process it's not about summer school it's a multi-year process Paul, go ahead and then we'll close with Anthony. Um, I guess I wasn't as enthused about the learning loss and schooling loss statement as Carol was, but I, the first thing that struck me is we're going to go away from standardization. Um, you know, we've worked very hard to have learning standards and we use those all the time. We've got them posted in every classroom. So um, then, but then you come to the other thing that may make sense to me. Uh, toward towards personalization and accusation is that really putting an IEP together for every child so help me understand that well I think in the project-based learning uh, units uh, you get a little bit more choice it's like a project lead the way work too right that you give kids the tools um, some equipment and then uh, you allow them to uh, chart their course for learning right so um, all of that's held within standards, right? So you're not just doing willy-nilly things, right? You're saying this is going to help you show some evidence in a reading standard or a writing standard or a history standard. Um, but that whole unit is around a set of standards, but we're not saying that there's only one path to demonstrating your understanding, right? You're, this one paper, this written paper, isn't the one way that demonstrates that you know and are able to um, demonstrate your understanding of that standard, right? There could be a different way of showing um, evidence that you've learned that standard. So, I mean, the whole thing of, about subject mastery, and the, the, you know, there's lots of ways to show subject, subject mastery. So, I mean, if that's what we're talking about here, then I, I, I can support that. that right, that's what we're talking about. Okay, all right. And then, um, you, you, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, getting, make sure that everybody's ready to graduate. Um, how, how many students are on the bubble right now that won't graduate this June? Kevin's got a better idea of that, of that than I do. So right now we're looking at um, basically about 15 to 20% at this point in time. But what happens is our, our counselors and, and, uh, our credit retrieval processes are working with all, they're working with the students. And, uh, and what we'll see is we'll see growth throughout uh, um, each, each week as students start to recover credits, as they start to meet standard, uh, because there's different areas uh, that we look at. One is uh, they have to finish a high school and beyond plan. They have to maintain their credits. And the other one um, is their pathway. And so the pathway is not finished until they finish some courses. So, as we go along, our, our number one goal is to make sure that uh, by the end of this year, we are we show growth in what we in graduation from what we were from last year. And I told the staff one one percent higher every year, and we keep growing. And so that's our goal uh, for this year. So I mean, so you said what fifteen percent? Fifteen to twenty. That? Yeah. Fifteen to twenty. So how many students is that? Um, that's going to be over a hundred. Okay, so several years ago we had 68 that didn't make it. So we're we're looking at right now that we're we're got we're focusing on about 100 students is what you're saying. Um, we're going to be yes, and then we're also uh, across the board at the, at the 12th grade level. Yes. Okay. So you know we have um, the academic recovery support has already started with credit retrieval. We started that back in uh, late March. So in additional support for those students and um, Kevin and Susie are also working on a plan for some additional support for some students here after in the next week or so to see if we can bring them up to um, passing in a couple courses. Also tonight on your agenda is a resolution about uh, allowing the emergency waiver to be used um, so that we can reduce in terms of students the number of credits they need to graduate. Um, 
drop it from uh, 30, we currently require down uh, to 28 um, by removing some elective credit and then to 26 if we need to for some core credit um, that could be a credit in English or a credit in math, as long as it's aligned to the high school and beyond plan. So, it, you know, Kevin was very important for him to say, you know, they need to complete their high school and beyond plan. They need to demonstrate that they've met the graduation pathway. And then we can look at some other options with the approval of the resolution tonight too for the um, use of the emergency waiver, which was approved by the State Board of Ed earlier in uh, March. No, a couple options along the way here. And tonight's sort of setting the stage for all those options to be put into play. Well, I, Brian, I, I think you've done a, you guys have done a wonderful job. I, you know, I agree with Carol on that because we, this isn't the first meeting that we have about this discussion. We know we've got issues because of where we're at, but you've got a plan, you're working the plan. I, I'm just always interested in the total number because, you know, when we get down to June, it, that's, that's a concern for me. And, yeah. uh, you know, because that, that's sure. supposed to, when parents get pretty upset, children get pretty disappointed and, uh, you know, but what you've shown me through these meetings and briefings that you got to plan your work in the plan and we, we should get there. So that's yeah. a good, so thank you. Kevin already analyzed third quarter grades uh, that were uh, finalized this past week as well. So we're getting it down, narrowing it down to the kids we really need to come in and lift up and support them, uh, you know, a, a bit more than what they've gotten to date, so. Yeah, I appreciate the comment about working the plan, Director Wagaman, and the reason that Kevin was able to rattle off that data fluently is because every Wednesday when we have our weekly meeting, we address that data, um, and the high school folks are, um, they're on it, with quotes around that. They are working this situation constantly, knowing that COVID added um, even more um, barriers to the work, but but they are working all the time. And uh, I smile because Kevin and I have this conversation, like I said, every week, and he's updating me every week as to the work that we're doing in terms of working the plan. So I appreciate the question. And then Anthony, you had a plan as well. I mean, a question. You might have a plan too. Yeah. And then Paul, would you go on mute, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, well, well I, I think this plan right here that was presented is uh, it, it makes sense, and I think it's a it's a good uh, pivotal move to to really you know aim at this, especially what we've been going through. Uh, one, one brief question though is just uh, when it comes to uh, you know struggling in a classroom or or on a subject. Um, do, do we have uh, additional assistance um, with, with tutoring or, or maybe that one on one time with that with that teacher um, so they can kind of understand and learn their, um, I, I guess, learning traits and how they can uh, adapt to, to to learn better or, or, you know, differently on that subject. So I might have Susie pop in for the, or address the elementary side of it, but in secondary, we've also been running, uh, I've started after school uh, tutoring sessions as well for students during, um, for additional support. So that's being supported at the school level. Um, in elementary, they do have intervention time built into their schedule. So they still meet with um, their specialists in reading or specialists in math, um, specialists in ELL, um, they, uh, special ed. So they have that schedule built in. So on the days where they're not in person, they also have the following day to meet with their interventionists. Um, so we still have that support system built into there, um, but a lot of that support's done remotely through our virtual learning platform. Did I get that? Did I miss something there, Susie? No, that's exactly right. And we, you know, the, the I guess the, for lack of a better word, the gift of them having, you know, a day in school or some of our kids day in school and day out of school is they don't miss their core instruction. So when they're meeting with their interventionists, they're not being pulled out of core instruction. So it's, it is, um, it's exactly what it's supposed to be, which is supplemental. It's uh, above and beyond. So um, we have really good success with our, with our um, program, with our lap program and our title program, um, as well as our kindergartners this year are getting some, um, one-on-one -on -one intensive intervention with our Washington Reading Corps. 
at, at some of our schools. So that's been really helpful with our kids because they're getting, it's a one-to-one -one or two-to-one ratio. So we're really getting them early with a preventative um, tutoring program, which we will probably use as we go into summer school because it's been a very, um, it's a pretty hefty program for our kids. Um, we found it's really um, quite um, uh, valid in terms of its data. And so we'll, we'll probably continue using that in this, during summer school as well. All right, excellent. Okay, well, that, that answers uh, my, my question. Thank you. Uh, I see Paul raising his hand again. Yeah, I just want one follow-up I forgot to ask was, have, is the state going to do their um, testing or is it waiver? What, have you got any update on that yet? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I probably get some more on Friday because we have a WASDA board meeting, but what do you know now? We have the, the OSPI has a waiver into the Federal Department of Education requesting to do a reduced version of, of, of assessment. Um, which would give a picture across the state in different uh, grade levels of how the state is doing. We don't have that. Um, that has not been responded to yet. Uh, if we don't get a waiver, then we would have to proceed with the regular SBA testing, which I will say openly and publicly, I, I do not want to have to do that because then we're going to dedicate a very significant amount of the nine weeks we have left of school to assessing students who haven't been in traditional school. Um, so I don't see a value to that. I see more value with regards to the question that Director Pearson asked, which is how will we know how our students are, what level they'll be at, and that would come from our normal uh, interim assessments that we, we do as a district, MAP, STAR, et cetera. Um, to spend a significant amount of the nine weeks we have left assessing students, going through a process really to assess students would not be as valid of information for us as a district as our interim assessments would be. Well, and what I might echo along those lines too is that we also have an opportunity to use those nine weeks to educate our children so that we can move towards learning recovery versus assessing them. And so every hour in that classroom is imperative that we use it to uh, give our children um, instruction time back. And so I can appreciate the comments and the questions. So Superintendent Banner, thank you. And uh, of course, thank you to uh, Brian Alba as well for that uh, update. The um, takeaway that is landing for me is that of course we are doing things very differently going forward, that there is no going back to just the way it was, that there's going to be more, much more of an online presence. And that I also uh, sense that um, the summer school and, and these activities are very likely going to be more innovative, a hybrid level. So that's, a, that's kind of a plus when we really think about it as well, in terms of um, being able to, have different modes of reaching and instructing our children. So there's obviously some benefits to it, but it, it really has been difficult. And I appreciate the effort that the district's making to bring everybody up to speed. So thank you. We'll now move to our regular consent agenda, which is items 21-100-21-106. Is there a motion for the consent agenda? made by Carol Jacobs, is there a second? Made by Alyssa Pearson. All those in favor of the consent agendas, please raise your right hand. And those opposed, the same. And uh, for record, the consent agenda passes unanimously. We'll now move to our individual action items. The first one that we have is individual action item 21-107, which is the Tyler Technologies Maintenance Agreement. Is there a motion? Made by Anthony, is there a second? Made by Alyssa Pearson, thank you. And then Superintendent Banner, would you speak to 21-107, please? Yes, this action item is a request to upgrade the previously approved Munis software system. 
Munis is the district's financial and human resources software system. We've used the system since 2005. The district has been reviewing different systems and has decided to continue to use the upgraded version of Munis to maximize our efforts with respect to fiscal responsibility. This would move us to an online web-based version. Um, financial and staff tracking include payroll, budget, position control, personnel information, purchasing program. Uh, the annual Munis contract was approved at the August 10th, 2020 board meeting with resolution 20-179. This action is a request to increase the dollar amount from that resolution in order to pay for the prorated costs of the upgrade for the remainder of this school year, which is a one-time fee, a one-time fee also for the new software costs and a one-time fee for the training as well as sales tax. Um, again, this was budgeted into our current year's uh, budget, so it would not impact the budget that you approved. We, we worked these costs into that budget. Um, I do recommend approval of this action. Questions on 21-107 or comments? Paul Wegeman. I, I don't have a question. Uh, we, we talked about this quite a bit in, uh, in our um, agenda review. And I, I think this is a, a really a good thing. You know, when you look at the cost, you say, well, this is HR department, a little bit of software for HR, that's expensive. But when you, when you, see the magnitude of this, this goes across the whole district. This isn't just a couple of little offices. This is this allows a lot of people to communicate and be part of the team in, in working a lot of the business decisions that are made within the district. So I, th I think this is a good one. Uh, you know, we all hate to see those kind of dollars go out for software, but you know, it's where we are today. And I, and I think this makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Alyssa? No, I just wanted to say because uh, uh, the last comment, we hate to see these dollars go for software, but I guess it's, I have a different mindset. So I just wanted to say that because I obviously work in the technology world and just the absolute importance of doing these, you know, sometimes people don't want to spend a bunch of money on software and, you know, anything technology related, it seems, but it really is kind of the center of our world nowadays so it's just um, i personally don't hate to see these like this because i just know software is just a critical part of everyday life thank you any other comments any other different comments yeah paul i, I just want to counter back to Alyssa. you know we we've been in, in software in this district, we've, we've been through multiple iterations of different things. Uh, our Skyward, you know, I think it's the third version we've been through. So, you know, it's, it's very important. We make good decisions when we do software. Um, my youngest son works in that whole field and uh, there's some good code out there and there's some not so good code. So it, it's, it's important that we do the right thing. Um, and certainly it's expensive. I know the young people that are right in this code are pretty darn smart but sometimes you don't always get the product you want. So it's very important. So I think this one from everything that I heard is probably right on target for what we need to do. Thank you. All right, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion carries unanimously. I'm now looking for a motion for individual action item 21-108, oh. the summer reading packs to support elementary students. Is there a motion? Made by Carol Jacobs, seconded by Alyssa Pearson. And again, Superintendent Benner, I know that we've gone over these in our agenda reviews very comprehensively, but would you speak to 21-108? Uh, Certainly. If approved, this action will allow the district to purchase grade level specific literacy materials for elementary students. These materials will be checked out to students in grade specific packets for continued learning during the summer months. This action will support the district learning recovery plan. Funds for this will be from the learning assistance program, which is what these dollars are for. These materials will also be provided in Spanish as needed to support families as they work with their young learners. I do recommend approval of this action. 
Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Carol. You're on mute, Carol, thanks. I know. In my agenda review, and Ron, I hope you'll share this, the fact when I asked about families who were interested in receiving this materials who maybe were a part um, of the LAP program or a thing, I think it's important, Ron said to me that any students who want to have this program will have access to it. So again, this is a real piece of equity that all students, and I appreciate the fact that that effort's being made. Um, was this something that the kids will use and check like like a library system where they take take it home and they will return it is so it doesn't become a part of their personal library it becomes a part of the school's um network of work correct right we we cannot give these materials away that would be a gift of public funds so we do okay. check this out to the to the students for the summer months and just responding back to any student who needs it remember our recovery plan will be comprehensive these dollars that we're asking for approval from are specific to lap students um, which means they are for a categorical uh, student, but we will be providing the um, whatever's needed for our students, for all students. If, and if I can tie on one other statement, um, one of the things a long time that I've learned through the reading process, I appreciate the fact that you are making these materials available for Hispanic families. Children learn and become good readers by hearing and learning reading. And studies have shown that it doesn't if you're an ELL student you don't have to be learning English and learning how to read the fact that we're making these materials available for all of our students is huge and this should be a big step in helping all students become better reading by the practice of reading the practice of being read to so thank you for reaching out and making it available for all students Anthony yeah, just to uh, clarify too, um, it, is it for a multiple language outside of just Spanish too? Maybe, um, maybe just as an example, maybe a, a, a Asian or, or, or Korean language or, or maybe some uh, other ones that, that we have also is it gonna be multi. So right now we're just focusing on the Spanish language. That's 34.7% of our, and the, fastest rising demographic, I think, in this region. Um, and so we are at this point just focusing on on the Spanish language in terms of the supplemental materials or supplemental language in the materials. OK, OK. And then, of course, if uh, maybe a family that speaks another language outside of that, they would just get assistance then? We would definitely work with any I'd like to put quotes around it because it sounds like a number, but one offs, if there was a need, we would definitely work with our teaching and learning department to support the need. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate those uh, comments from the board. Not seeing any other. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion uh, carries unanimously as well. We're now at 21-109, which is the resolution for emergency waiver of high school graduation credits. We heard about that in report tonight. Is there a motion? Made by Anthony Velez and a second. Made by Alyssa Pearson, thank you. And Superintendent Banner, would you uh, address the 21-109? Uh, Yes, this resolution provides the district um, for the district to comply with chapter 180-111 of the Washington Administrative Code, which constitutes the State Board of Education's emergency waiver program, so that any district students who would be eligible with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic for a waiver of credits or graduation pathway or both under the emergency waiver program can benefit from this program. Students would be eligible in our district to waive up to 1.5 elective credits and 0.5 or half of a social studies credit, which typically would take place within a cultural studies, economics, psychology, or sociology course. Students would still have to complete their world problems credit, 1.0 credit, their US history 1.0 credit, and their civics or contem and contemporary world problems 1.0 credit. Um, I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you. And then board directors, any questions or comments from your perspectives? 
Paul, I saw you raise your hand first. Yeah, um, I mean, at, at, at first thought, when you look at this, you say, well, does this really make sense? You know, why, why are we dropping standards? We, we should work harder, right, and get people trained. But, but I think in, in our agenda review, we had a discussion on this. This is, this is kind of like, uh, um, you, you know, as, as they talked about the, this graduation plan, you know, making sure everybody's there at the end. I think that we talked about 100 students. You know, if you have one or two that have a real problem, this gives some flexibility to our, our administrative team to make an exception uh, and that'll help this child get on in life. And so from that perspective, it's a good thing. You know, this has been looked over by the State Board of Education. Um, you know, they they work through this whole thing too. So uh, it is as bad as it is in a way as it sounds, it's it just gives some flexibility to our team to make sure we can deal with some of the individual students with those tough situations. Other questions or comments? Not seeing any, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion carries unanimously as well. So thank you. We'll now go to 21-110, the contact uh, contract award for the roof replacements. Is there a motion? Thank you, Anthony. Second by Carol. And Superintendent Banner, would you speak to the uh, contract award for roof replacements? Certainly. Approval of this action permits the district to award contracts for roof replacements at several of our sites as determined by the maintenance and operations department's annual repairs and life cycle preventative maintenance schedule. These sites are Tillicum Elementary School, Tillicum Head Start Program Portables, Kendrick House, which is where Caring for Kids is housed, Clover Park High School Portables, Oak Brook Elementary, Clover Park Early Learning Program, and Taiyi Park Elementary School. Appropriate competitive bid processes have been followed based on RCW 39.34.030. Um, we have a, a contractor funding source is capital projects budget, and the funding amount includes taxes plus a 15% contingency with a total budget pro total project budget of $3,098,509.01. I do recommend approval of this action. And then uh, questions or comments from the board? Paul, you had your hand raised first again. Yeah, I, I, I think Superintendent Banner touched on a couple of things that I want to comment on. But just, just so you know, when, when you look at these numbers, it's a big number, you know, and, it, and it's kind of scary. You say, man, why have roofs caught that much? Uh, so I break it down to some things that I can personally understand. Uh, we're doing um, Clover Park High School portables. Uh, a portable, you know, is about the size of a house. But we didn't have an exact number of how many squares of shingles were going on there. But but for that one, the breakout cost is $60,000. Um, so if, you know, my particular house is where I'm about 45 squares on my house, which works out to if I wanted to put a, um, a standing seam roof on it, a metal roof, it would be somewhere between 30 and $50,000. That's that's about what it would cost. So I, I, again, I don't know how many squares. Now we're not putting a metal roof on these uh, these portables. We're putting um, asphalt shingles. Um, so then the question is: Is why is it so much? Why is it so much? Well, one of the things we have to do, and I think citizens need to know this, that we have to pay prevailing wage. Second off, we have to pay sales tax and all these things. So those are things that bump up costs that we have to use with our tax dollars. So, you know, if you don't like some of those things and we got to take it up with our legislators and see if they can do something to help us. But that's where it is. The other thing um, I've looked into this before uh, on our competitive bid process, and I'm, I'm very confident in our staff. Um, I've, I've looked at it in the past uh, and, the, and the people that were doing it in the past are still doing it. So I have every confidence that they're doing a good job. So is distasteful as some of these numbers are, uh, it, this is the right thing. So I agree with Superintendent Banner. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion carries unanimously. We're now moving to 21-111, the dedication of the uh, temporary construction easement to the Lakewood Water District. Is there a motion? Paul and seconded by Anthony. Thank you. Superintendent Banner, would you speak to 21-111? Yes, this uh, approval of this action will allow the Lakewood Water District a temporary construction easement and allows the superintendent to sign the easement without further approval of the board. The Lakewood Water District is in need of this easement to install a water pipeline utility through a portion of the district's property located at 10202 Early Avenue Southwest, which is where our early learning program is housed, also formerly known as Southgate Elementary School for those that didn't catch it by just the address. Um, specifically, the easement will be to, uh, the project will go through the access road from 100th Street to our property. The construction easement allows for the construction and allows that we will uh, not build any structures on that road. The road will be restored to its specific specified condition upon completion of the project. And I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you. Questions, I, Paul Wegeman. Yeah, I, I, on this particular one, if you look at the map, it just goes across one little corner of our, our property. So even, even if we uh, wanted to build something up close to it, where we, the setback from the property line is far enough that it, it's, it's a non-impact. And certainly working with our community for water, uh, you know, I mean, our Lakewood Water District does a wonderful job for us. And, you know, we, we talk about lead and stuff. And so they're working all those issues. So when they take these, uh, put new structures in place, it's a good thing for our whole community. So thank you. Yes, any other questions or comments? Carol. Will this be started and finished during the summer months? So it won't in, impact the kids going to school. I believe well, so, but let me throw that to Rick Ring. I believe we talked about that, Carol. So I apologize. I don't have the, the response. Rick, can you speak to the construction timeline? Yeah, I don't have the exact timeline on it, but yes, Carol, they'll work around our schedule. Our that okay. program is actually open in the summer too. So uh, oh. it will be coordinated with what works for our schedule as well. Okay. Thank you. And then Ron, I just want to acknowledge that again for the public that as Paul has shared during our agenda reviews and even prior, so we get the information prior to the agenda review, we read it and we come in and uh, take a more comprehensive approach. But these, these issues really are thoroughly looked at. We're not just uh, happenstance saying yes to these things. And I appreciate the fact that um, we are making decisions that are going to be in the long range, best interest of our facilities and buildings. And so I also want to agree with Paul Wegman, the fact that this is just another area where it's right to partner with our uh, Lakewood Water District as well. So all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And then motion carries unanimously as well. We can now go to 21-112, the Cooler Park School District and City of Lakewood Cooperative. Um, use agreement. Is there a motion made by Anthony and seconded by uh, Carol Jacobs? And uh, Superintendent Banner, would you speak to 21-112, please? Yes. Approval of this action authorizes the superintendent to finalize and execute the cooperative use agreement with the city of Lakewood for the purpose of efficient use of public resources, improving local or student services, and providing more opportunities for the community members that we all serve. This agreement has been developed between the district and the city with representatives from respective staff and legislative bodies. The agreement honors the district's priority use of its facilities, the city's facility needs to support the citizens and youth of Lakewood, as well as our many other community users. This agreement is a highlight and testament to the partnership that the district shares with the city of Lakewood and is supportive of our community at large. I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you, Superintendent Banner. Any questions or comments from the board? Paul, you had your hand up first. I, I, I think this is, a good, again, a good thing. It's something that I was hoping for. Uh, I think uh, 
school buildings have a tendency to be the centers of community. And this gives us a possibility uh, for everyone to be able to use those facilities. I, again, noting that, the, and I think Superintendent Banner hit it, is that the primary use of those buildings is to help educate our children. But being community centers fits with our CELP program and all those kinds of things. It's, I think, so, so important. And uh, so I, I think this is a good thing. There's a lot of words in this in this policy. So we have to thank Carol for and, and the council members that worked on that uh, for getting that done. I, th I think it's probably not perfect. You know, hopefully, Carol, you'd like to be perfect, but it's probably not. But I, but the things that I saw in there that I liked, there was some things where we could uh, um, work with the city if there was some issue to work through those. So I think this this document um, at least get us started down the road in the right direction. And if we find something that doesn't work, there's mechanism in it to place to fix those and make it go forward in a good way. So thanks, Carol, and uh, it's a good. Carol, you had your hand up, would you share as well? Um, I just wanted to say that I, for the record, I think it's important. Um, there were three of us from the district that worked on this, Rick Ring and John Boltman. And this was probably a five or six meeting process. So this really did take a while to put it out. The one of the things that was really important is like, we just approved you know, some major funds for our roofs and we, 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 keep, our, we keep our buildings maintained up to a standard that's a, what we believe is a very high standards. We were very, made, we made sure, and we had lots of conversations centering around making sure that our standards for our kids are maintained and kept while community programs are also using our schools. And, and, and the city, you know, totally agreed as versus with their programs and their services also. So this is a partnership. It's a very strong partnership. And I think this is a partnership that I went there on the aspect as a citizen making sure that citizens had accessibility, they also had responsibilities, and that um, there are priorities on how things are done. And sometimes people think, well, they should just be able to use it. Well, there's a cost to it, but that's also to maintain and keep our buildings open and functioning for all community members. So thank you, Rick and John, for the process and for the city, and for the city, Mary, um, from the record, Mary Dodsworth was very instrumental in doing this also. So this really was a proven and former uh, uh, council member, John Simpson. So thank you to that work. And I think that our, you know, it's a better partnership. I hope that we can create more activities and more things for our kids with our buildings, but sharing the responsibility of it. Thank you, Carol. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any more, I'll ask that those who are in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion uh, carries unanimously. We'll now move to 21-113, the adoption of policy. Is there a motion? Made by Alyssa Pearson and seconded by Anthony Velez, thank you. Superintendent Banner, would you speak to our adoption of policy 21-113? Yes, so approval of this action will authorize the adoption of policy 4211 school resource officer program. This policy is mandatory based on state legislation, House Bill 1216, and establishes boundaries on the roles and duties of a school resource officer. The policy outlines the roles of an SRO as law enforcement teacher and informal counselor um, it establishes training for SROs on when to informally enforce school rules and when to enforce the law. The board has been briefed on this policy through agenda reviews in both first and second reading of policy, and the policy has been reviewed by both the district and police department leadership, and it meets the intent of the legislation, House Bill 1216. I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, Paul Wegeman. Okay, um, I, I can't stand in support of this. And the primary reason I can't stand in support of this is the second paragraph, second sentence. And I brought this to people's attention in the past. I'll read it again. It says, school resource officers should focus on keeping students out of the criminal justice system 
when possible and should not be used to attempt to impose criminal sanctions and matters that are more appropriately handled within the education system. If we're gonna have accountable systems, then we need our educators to hold people accountable. We don't need police officers to do it. So in my opinion, we could take the money that we're spending here and put it into reading programs. And then we can, we can do like every other citizen in this community and every other business in this community, if they need police support, they call 911 and it's taken care of. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Alyssa Pearson. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'd just like to say that there's a lot of other reasons to have SROs on school campuses. Um, I personally find nothing wrong with that sentence. Of course, you want students to stay out of the criminal justice system. I think that that's always a goal um, to have that. That's not always going to be the case, but I would hope that it's always the goal. Um, and, you know, having police presence on school campuses, you know, builds relationships, better communities. There, I mean, I personally find it extremely beneficial um, for many reasons other than like, I, my goal is not to have students get in trouble when they're on campus. I want safety. You know, there are unfortunately school shootings. Um, it makes me feel safer for our students to have them on campus. I, I just think there are so many positives and I, I personally find a goal of keeping students out of the criminal justice system also a goal um, so they can have bright futures because um, we all know if you have a record, it makes your life a lot more difficult, so. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Was I'd, I'd acknowledge the um, power of what you shared in both those areas in terms of building healthy relationships with law enforcement. And then also the fact that even though our uh, police officers have, I think, a great track record of getting to their calls uh, quickly, if there is a school shooting, three, to, three minutes to four minutes could be catastrophic. And so just that added security of having them there also means something to me too. So I just appreciate both of those things uh, that you shared. And so, thank you. Anybody else with any other questions or comments? Carol. I, you know, I just wanna say I really ditto and I, I wanna agree with Alyssa. I don't think I need to add anything because she was very eloquent in what she said. Um, the relationships that some of these officers develop with our students from middle school on up, um, sometimes, their lifelong relationships. And I really appreciate them being there. Um, did a, Alyssa, I just ditto. I agree with everything that you said. And I thought it was very well stated for what our purposes for our kids are. And then, uh, Paul, I see your hand up again. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody's countering. I, I, you know, I guess we could have some further discussion. Uh, having school resource officers or armed officers at school shooting sites hasn't been very successful to this point in time, so the data doesn't support that comment. Second, um, certainly, is it our job? Is it our job to um, spend school money that should be going to education to help build relationship with police officers? Maybe, but our job is to make sure our children are educated. And so, Mike Zarro, he's, he's the police chief. His job should be to build, build relationships with police officers and students. It should come out of his budget, not our budget. That's my thought. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And then they'll pose the same, raise your right hand. And so it's uh, four to one and the motion carries. Thank you. We'll now go to 21-115, uh, the paper tutoring support for secondary students. Is there a motion? Excuse me, there's one other resolution right before that, the right. school resource officer. I'm, I'm sorry, thank you for the uh, point of order. We're now at 21-114, the school resource officer contract. And so is there a motion? 
made by Carol, seconded by Alyssa Pearson. And then uh, Superintendent Banner, would you speak to 21-114 resource officer, the actual contract? Yes, so this action authorizes the superintendent to contract with the city of Lakewood for uh, Lakewood police officers to serve as school safety officers or school resource officers assigned exclusively to the duty with the Clover Park School District. Um, this action is authorizing this contract for the remainder of the 2021 school year, noting that we are instituting that now because we are just getting back to school in secondary or recently getting back to school in secondary, as well as for the 21-22 school year. The board did receive a report on this topic at the February workshop, and I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you. And then I know we kind of had some of this conversation, but uh, board directors, any other comments or questions on this? Anthony Velas. Yeah, I have a uh, question on the, the scheduling. Uh, how how often are they going to be there? And I, I see that we're requesting four officers per day. So, of course, we have a lot of schools. Um, how, how do we, you know, divide that up? How do, how do we know which officer is going to which one? Is there certain schools that officers are going to spend more time at? Or, or you know, what are we looking at for, for schedule? And then Superintendent Banner, would you be able to speak to that? I, I could, but I'd rather you. So forgive me, I was checking on the next resolution. Anthony, could you please repeat that for me? Yeah, no problem. Um, so just uh, referring to the schedule, um, how do we know which officers are, are going to which schools? And, and are, are we looking at having officers go to certain schools more and, and have more attention to certain um, schools and and um, I see that we have four officers per day so so that means you know obviously we can only send one to each school is that correct or are we sending maybe one or two to the same school um, and and if they're doing a minimum of four hours uh, per visit is it broken up so for example would they stay you know, mornings mornings at schools seem to be the most uh, one of the hot times. I, I would just guess. You know, as far as maybe where they need extra security or or backup, um, and and lunch times too. You know, those are another. It seems like you know maybe fights might break out or so forth. Um, so, our uh, how, how do we get the scheduling down? Basically, is what what I'm curious with. So I'm going to let Rick Ring speak to that very fluently. What I what I, we do have one officer per high school, and then the other two officers are shared between our middle school programs as well as Harrison Prep. Um, so the officers per high school would be there all day long. The officers at the middle schools they would determine if maybe there's a reason to go to Lockburn first rather than Hutloff or or Harrison Prep because of something that's going on. But they would determine that scheduling if we felt like the data supported that there was a need at one school or the other. But they would split the time between the middle schools. Rick, I know that I probably just answered that question, but help me if I missed anything. Uh, the only thing I would add is officers sign up for, they, they get the schedule in advance and then officers sign up for it. So this is considered an extra duty contract for the, by the law, by the city of Lakewood. So the officers rotate based on their schedules and their availability, but we expect uh, officers in all of our, uh, four officers in our schools all day long. Uh, they may be splitting up, but the two high schools primarily have them all day long. And then the other piece is that as they're, if they're absent, there is another officer, a sergeant that is also available to backfill, at, or we can call 911 as well. Okay, okay. Um, so if they're there all day, um, are, are they walking the halls? Are, are they maybe walking into classrooms? Um, what, what would they be doing as far as when, when students aren't really out and about? Yeah, they might be in the hallway, they would be at lunchtime, they would be, let's say the kids are out on the field for, they're going to move about the school, um, they're going to respond to any concerns that the administration may have, they, they may be doing follow-ups, if 
I'm going to make this up right now, but maybe there was a CPS call the day before and that officer is going to maybe get that because they know they're working at Lakes High School or I'll just pick that out of the air. Um, so they may be doing follow up work, but they're also going to be meandering throughout the building. Um, that might not be the best uh, phrase, but they're going to be connecting with kids, connecting with staff. And so they are at that building as a staff member. Um, if there's an assembly, they're going to be at the assembly. Um, Yep. supervising etc right the, the other thing this contract does is allow for uh, the ability to hire officers for the games and things like that so this contract is broader than just the sros it's also for the after after school activities and things like that okay okay i know that's a uh sometimes after a basketball or football game i've seen in my you know own eyes it can get a little rowdy once in a while and uh that that might be that might be a really good idea, so. Carol, I noticed oh. that you had your hand up. Oh, I'm yep, sorry, yep. Anthony. Anthony, did oh, you no. have another? Nope, that, that was it. Thank you, though. Yeah, thank you. I just kind of want to share an observation that I've seen through the years. I, I think what, what the officers are doing in school, they're really engaging with students. They're engaging in students about behavior sometimes. They're engaging with them just on just getting to know them. So they really have an engagement with these kids and thus they have developed relationships through their, they, they, they know these kids, they know where they live. Some of these kids go to these guys and tell them things that are going on in their lives that they, you know, need someone to talk to. So I think I see them as, as real engagers of students that maybe um, the, the kids need these guys. So, and when I say guys, excuse me, I'm saying when these, the school, need, the kids need the officers. So anyway, I, I, the student engagement that the officers have with these, uh, with our students is pretty incredible. So, because the officers do choose to be there and they care about our kids. So I think it's pretty powerful. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Paul. Yeah, this, I, I think this contract does a good job of um, doing what the state has asked us to do. And I, I, the primary thing that the state's involved in in this is making sure that um, uh, school resource officers, whoever we use, whether it be part of the local police department or sheriff's department um, or contract somebody else out, that they're properly trained in, in working through the issues, you know, to get some mental health training and all those other things. There's a whole laundry list that uh, the RCW puts in place. And, uh, and this contract does that. So, you know, that, so that's a good thing. So Rick and his team did a good job there. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions, we'll call for a, a vote. Please raise your right hand. All those opposed can do the same. Motion carries unanimously. So we are now at 21-115, uh, the paper tutoring mm -hmm. support for the secondary students. Is there a motion made by Alyssa Pearson? Is there a second made by Anthony Valdez? And the Superintendent Banner, would you please speak to 21-115? Yes, so approval of this action would allow the district to contract with the company Paper, um, which provides 24 hour, seven day per week academic support person-to-person -person support on tutoring services for grades six through 12. Uh, we believe we are in the need for an immediate support for our current students, and we would be contracting with this company over the course of the next two years, again, as part of our recovery plan. The dollars that we would um, charge this to is our ESSER 3, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 recovery um, dollars. It is a significant cost. Uh, when you break it down by unit, it comes up to about $34 per student. Um, I can't imagine any parent who wouldn't, unless they couldn't, spend $34 for their child to have 24-hour uh, tutoring services to help supplement their education. Um, but we do know that there are students and a lot of students in our district that can't afford that. So again, as part of reducing barriers and providing recovery, we would provide this at no cost to students. And again, using the federal stimulus dollars that are afforded to us for this purpose. Uh, I do recommend approval of this action. Thank you. 
Directors, anyone want to speak to this? Paul Wegeman, I see your hand up. Yeah. Uh, Superintendent Banner, you just you just made a comment that it's you you gave a cost, and I missed this during um, um, agenda review. If a family can afford to pay, will they pay? No, and let me openly apologize for not having covered this during agenda review. Um, it was not; it was a last-minute add in order to get it into um, the uh, to get approval so that we could support the kids. No, we would not be asking any family member to pay for this. This again would be covered out of our uh, stimulus dollars for all students six through grades six through twelve. So basically from an equity point of view, what we're saying is that any student that is interested in using this service, it's gonna be available. Absolutely, and just to clarify, we wouldn't just be throwing it out there for any student who wants to. We will be using this within our classrooms. We would train our teachers on how to support, uh, hey, you've got this paper coming up and I'm gonna give you the instruction and for some extra help, you could go to paper and we can upload those assignments so that the tutor when the tutor works with the student that they're actually working with the assignment from the teacher. And again, all subjects, multiple languages, well beyond Spanish. We actually looked into that piece, Anthony. Um, and, uh, and we would be promoting this use. We wouldn't just be wanting to purchase this and, and have it be happenstance. So quick answer to your question, Director Wagman, every single student would have access to this and we would be promoting the usage. And and do we pay just when we use the service or is, is there some continuing, I mean, do they get say a hundred thousand bucks to be available to us and then we pay each student that they use or how does that work? We would pay per student, so per unit. So every student, grade six through 12, we would pay that fee, which is again, why we wouldn't let this be a happenstance. If we're gonna, we and we do, if we believe that this is going to support our students and we do, we're going to be working this. We're not going to just be buying it and hoping people use it. We're going to be incorporating this into our recovery plan. Okay. Alyssa, I noticed you had your hand up. Yes, I apologize if this was already asked or having a newborn meltdown in the background. <laughs> um, but I noticed in the documents that it said that video wouldn't be available is that is that accurate so it wouldn't be a video call or maybe i completely misread the materials you have that correct you have that correct Alyssa. it is um they really want students to engage with the platform not with a specific tutor so when you go on and you're asking your question you'll post a picture of the work you have if you if it's not previously loaded by the teacher and then through the chat function, you would be getting your assistance from the tutor. It's not a face-to-face -face tutoring system. Okay, but so there's no voice, it's through a chat system, so not even That's live. a little bit about protection for both the student and the tutor, right? So that there's not this, um, you can do a lot through the chat function, right? And just having a conversation there and not, um, um, having this face-to-face -face sound conversation like we're having right now, right? But um, and Would you say that that's as effective? I, and I only ask because my, this isn't the same thing, but my son is like in speech therapy and he, and it's hard over right. the video function, like, cause we can't do face-to-face. -face. And I, you know, I do feel like, you know, in-person even would be better. And this in-person obviously isn't available. Then it's usually video chat then it's another form. So do you feel like the platform that they have set up um, is equally as beneficial as if like there was a video option yes. available? Yes. Okay. It, it, um, it really is about privacy for the students, privacy for the tutor, right? You're not showing your backgrounds of your homes, your, your rooms, oh. right? You're, you think about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, even though you can blur some of it or you can change your backgrounds, all that sort of thing. Um, it does uh, allow for just to talk about the work, right? So, um, and they don't get to see the same tutor every time. They get to see a different tutor based on whenever they're accessing, right? They're at 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. It's, it's whoever it's gonna answer the chat question. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. 
And I think the short answer to your question is no, it's not as the same and it's not as good, but it is the best that we can. Yes. Um, and, and coming back to Brian's point, protection for the student and protection for the tutor are also benefits of not having the video or the verbal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great questions though. Not seeing any other questions, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And motion carries unanimously as well. So thank you uh, for that. We'll now move to our matters for discussion and information, acknowledging that there's a first reading. And uh, again, as we see our first reading, some of them are um, things that we really do need to be aware of and be able to have time to speak to. And so please make sure that you do your reading and ask uh, questions uh, of the superintendent or direct them to myself as well so that we can make sure that we move them. And of course, they can also be addressed at our workshops uh, also. I'll now ask you to move to your board member reports. And so um, why don't we go to District 5 and uh, start with Paul, then work our way backwards. And again, you don't have to report. If you want to report, go ahead. If you don't, just say pass. The, I, I have a couple things. Um, th this week, we had the opportunity to go to the NSBA conference. Um, I don't know how many other board members went. Uh, I started on Thursday and went all the way through Saturday. Um, I, again, I, th I think a pretty valuable event. Um, again, the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, was probably one of the the hot items uh, this particular time. So, uh, if if you if you registered, you can go back and look at some of those conversations. And um, there's a few that you know were I thought better than others, but you know we'll I'll save that conversation for another time. The um, this Friday, we have a WASDA board meeting. So if anybody has any issues or questions that they would like me to bring up at the WASDA board meeting, I would be happy to entertain those. So call me, text me, email me, whatever. I'd be happy to take care of that. And then um, to a more current thing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I, I asked several questions after our last workshop, and I still haven't received answers. And so um, I guess you know my questions are what what philosophical reason are we re rewriting our equity and excellent policy? Haven't got an answer for that yet. Um, then you know what are we trying to fix? What's broken that we're trying to fix? Haven't got an answer for that yet. And once a policy is written, you know what what's our desired outcome? What what do we hope to have happen? Um, th those again I've asked have not been answered, so I'm asking again. Um, for some reason, they haven't been answered. And to me, to me, these answers, every one of us as a board member should have an answer for these questions. Um, and if not, certainly people in our staff should have answers for these and I haven't heard from anyone yet. So I would, be, I would um, appreciate some response on that. And let's see, I think that's all I have at this point in time. So thank you very much. You're, you're muted, President Schaefer. Thank you. Our next person, uh, Anthony, would you like to share a board member report this week or pass? I, I will pass. Thank you, though. All right, thank you. Carol, would you like to share this week or pass? I just have one thing to say. I want to thank both Lakes High School and Clover Park High School for the opportunity to listen and be and be an observer in some of their senior presentations. Um, they were outstanding. I had the opportunity to listen to, um, I think, th almost four and two, I believe. One girl um, had to have an interpreter time and it really interpreter present, and it really showed me what some of these kids are going through and what their families are going through on the communication. Congratulations to both these schools. These kids were prepared, whether they were going on to college, whether they were going to the tech school, where they were going, where, wherever they were going, they had a plan and they knew why they were going there. They knew what they wanted out of, the, out of their, after their 13th year. They did an incredible job. 
Um, their community services, their 20 hours of community services were all varied and very personal to them. And uh, we have some great kids um, who have met the bar and who are gonna be able to graduate, who have done a phenomenal job. So congratulations to, to, to those two schools and to the kids who I had the opportunity and the privilege to observe. Thank you. And then Alyssa Pearson, would you like to share a board member report? Um, I think I'm good. Done a lot of behind the scenes things, I guess you could say, but I'm also still trying to find my new normal. So here we are. <laughs> so nothing exciting to report. Yeah, I, I can totally appreciate whatever new normal is, because I'm not sure we were hitting regular normal before. And so it has been interesting. I uh, acknowledge that there also has been a lot of behind the scenes things and things uh, are being worked on and moving forward. And there is a lot of work that our district has done and is putting into motion. I'm just very appreciative of the fact that we're looking at one of the most difficult times uh, in terms of educating students this last year and having done a remarkable, remarkable job of getting us to this place. And while I um, know that sometimes we do make it and we, we always need to have the right indicators on the radar screen in terms of just attendance and graduation rates as we've discussed tonight, academic standards, those are all uh, important to us. At the same time, the overall um, success of the student is more than that. And I, I know that our teachers have probably never worked harder uh, than they have this year. And that's not just for our school district, that's, that's across the United States. And so uh, anywhere across the United States now, the data is showing that the learning loss is 70, 70 to 30%. Um, in districts. And so that is a huge mountain uh, to overcome. And so you can imagine that work. And I also want to acknowledge something that the superintendent said, and I just want to make sure we all hear it, um, is that it's not just going to be trying to get through this school year, that next year we're going to be having to roll up our sleeves and work harder than we have before too. And so if those things are true, and Superintendent Banner, I don't doubt that they are true, then if we don't have a, a renewed uh, resiliency, tenacity, higher levels of character and leadership, we don't have a desire to see students uh, learn and be engaged, then it's going to be a really tough battle. But I trust that we, we have created success in those areas, and that makes me hopeful uh, for not only just learning recovery, but seeing our students excel. And I also don't want to miss the fact that at the very beginning, we heard several students who are going to Ivy League schools, who are going on to uh, be able to have amazing careers because of the efforts that have been made by our teachers and our staff and our community as well in supporting our students. So I just want to make sure we look at the whole picture because sometimes we get caught up in just this moment. And I'm grateful for everything that each person has done, uh, Superintendent Banner in your district. And I also want to say to the board, I'm appreciative of, of each and every one of you and the perspectives that you bring. I know that each of our perspectives help us to be holistic in our approach and also to move towards uh, one team and one vision. And so it, it is very much appreciated. That being said, I'll note that there is no executive session for tonight and I will now look for a motion to adjourn made by Anthony Velez and seconded by Paul Wegman. All those in favor of adjourning at 7.54 p.m., would you please raise your right hand? And the motion carries unanimously. Again, I wanna also uh, thank the staff, the district, and of course, our wonderful community and public for attending our meeting tonight. Thank you. <laughs>